First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read verse 1 through 4 and then verses 8 through 9. And Elisha the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As long as the Lord God of Israel lives before as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word then the word of the Lord came to him saying now you get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook of Sharif which flows into Jordan and it will be that you shall drink from the brook I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Somebody say there. And then verse 8 and 9. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell where? There. So I have commanded, see, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Somebody say there. So I'm going to get right to the message from the topic. Do you want to go there this year? Do you want to go there? This, oh yeah, I'm going there. This year. Today. Father, thank you for this time. Amen. This message is for somebody that's listening to me who knows that there is some place or something that is just waiting on you to show up i'm preaching already i'm right in right in this area right here it's always my biggest struggle right in right in this area right here to get people to focus and to kind of tune in that there's a place there's some people who know that there's some place or something that is just waiting on you to show up this message is also for somebody who knows that there's somewhere that you're on your way to. But you feel like maybe, just maybe, you're in a holding pattern. And, and you're, you're really just waiting to land. Uh, I'm a million miler with Delta and I'm a diamond medallion. Two of the highest um, <laughs> status that you can hold with any airline but when I get on the plane my wife with me they announce on the thing we thank God we have a not thank God I mean I'm so saved I mean they thank God the pilot be like thank God no <laughs> we'd like to welcome our million miler today sitting in 5B with Adam Von McLaughlin and uh, he's a million miler and diamond medallion and everybody go Ugh. so I've been on a lot of planes and there are times when we get close to landing that plane that the pilot sometimes comes over the intercom and he says or she says that we have reached our destination but we have not yet been cleared to land. We are going to have to circle the airport because there's another plane still connected to our arrival gate. And so we have to circle. And sometimes you make those long turns and you're going around, you're looking at the airport and you're just circling the airport. So I, I'm, I'm trying to, of course, make my connection, right? I, I got the time on my ticket. I know exactly what time I'm supposed to land and I know what time I'm supposed to be to the next gate. So I got to make this connection in order to get to my connection so I can get the heck up out of here and get to where I got to go. But I've discovered that the air traffic controller knows a whole lot more than I do. So we can't land until the airport is ready to receive us. You, you don't get it. You see, as a type of air traffic controller, God is that. And the controller knows exactly what's keeping a flight from arriving 
at the scheduled time or the scheduled time and destination that's on our ticket. We know what the ticket says, but the air traffic controller or God knows what time we're going to arrive. His ways are not our ways. Neither are his thoughts our thoughts. And our plans are not his plans for us. Because I used to be impatient like so many novel riders or people who are novice. They start panicking. Why we didn't land? Why you can hear them on the plane? Hey! Hey! <laughs> but as a seasoned diamond medallion traveler, I've learned the importance of allowing the air traffic controller to do his job. You don't get it. See, he knows what I don't know. And he can see what I can't see. I see the airport. He knows exactly where my gate is. So the people of God have got to learn the benefits of just waiting. Just waiting. Waiting is actually a power source. Waiting for some people is, oh, devastating. But waiting is like plugging in that e-car at night and recharging the battery in that mobile. That's an electric car for some of you that still got that Pinto in the garage, <laughs> that Vega, if <laughs> you still got the Vega holding on. Uh, it's just like plugging in your phone at night or now taking your new iPhone 15 and hitting it and letting it go down a little bit and turning it sideways and it serves as your night clock. Y'all need to upgrade your phones or something. <laughs> Because that's, to me, the greatest feature of the iPhone 15 there is. I mean, I thought y'all were going to like, yes! <laughs> you know, you go home and try it. <laughs> Listen to what waiting can do for you. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk, good God Almighty and not faint. You see that? They shall not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And the lamentation writer, the preacher says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation or the deliverance of the Lord. Waiting on God will strengthen you, renew you. Waiting on God is pleasing to God and allow God to do good as it relates to you. If you just learn how to wait on him. Somebody say, wait, 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 wait. For some of us, if we had what God eventually is leading us to or wants us to have, if we had it right now, it would destroy us. There's just certain things you're not ready for and you need to wait. Wait. Somebody say, wait. Wait on the Lord. In 1 Kings, God takes a man, a Tishbite, unheard of at this time, and he uses this man, Elisha, to shake a nation. Elisha. When God raised him up, it was awful times for the people of God. Their worship has been invaded and literally hijacked by the people of that world, the people, the enemies of God in that area. The people of God were literally in the midst of people who were worshiping a Phoenician God known as Baal. Baal. Baal is the name of many little small deities, a little many little G gods, idol gods. But this is different. This is specifically the Phoenician God Baal, that is commonly known as the god of fertility or the god of the elements. The heat, the rain, the snow, the, the god of the elements. They believed that when the sun rose, at least I didn't believe, it meant that Baal was smiling and his face was shining. They believed that whenever the winds blew, they believed that Baal had just taken a deep breath and exhaled and cooled off his people. When the thunder rumbled and it shook the earth, they believed that Baal was applauding their good deeds and their good works as they worked to satisfy or to please him. And whenever there was lightning flashing in the sky, it was simply their Baals or their little gods way of displaying his wrath 
and his disapproval of his followers. So he was the God of the elements, and, and that's how they viewed him. So with this in mind, we can see now the significance of even Elijah on Mount Carmel calling down fire. We can see the significance of this prayer to shut up heaven so that the rain won't fall. So we can see this right now, right down to this very verse of scripture when the Bible says in 1 Kings 19 11, and he said, God did go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord and before and behold, the Lord will pass by and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains. First thing, a strong wind and then break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Right. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, earthquake was fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still small voice. It says God was not in the earth, wind or fire. I wrestled with that for years. How can God not be in earth, wind and fire? That's the way of the world hearts of fire he ain't not <laughs> I mean I'm like earth wind and fire when Cassiel Knox said I love the Lord but God is in earth wind and fire I had a roommate in college boy he was the earth wind and fire fanatic but God was not in the, the wind the, the earthquake nor the fire but a still small voice remember Baal the false god now is associated with those elements Right. So you have the fire, the wind, the earthquake. But what you wind up with is finding out that the true and the living God ain't in none of that. The devil is an imitator. God could have used any one of those elements, but Elijah could have been fooled by any one of those elements. But there's one thing the devil can't fully, completely imitate. It's the still, small voice of God. The still, small voice. The Lord's whisper is louder than the loudest noise and demonstration of the devil. The voice of the Lord is unmistakable. John 10, 27. It says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they Follow me. Deuteronomy 4.12 says, And the Lord spake to you out of the midst of the fire. This is Moses. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice, a clear voice, the voice of the Lord. You got to know it. You got to know the voice of God when you hear it. John 10 and 3 says, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The voice of the Lord. We got to learn that still, small voice of the Lord. We got to learn God's voice. Elijah knew the voice of God. And we need preachers today that know the voice of God. We need preachers with the spirit of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah. Even today, we'll see that Elijah's dilemma begin when he stood up. Before a bunch of people worshiping the false god, Baal. And he stands up and he preaches a sure word. Here's what he says. 1 Kings 17 and 1b. There shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Did y'all get that? Basically he says, ain't going to be no rain. Now go tell Baal that. And basically that's all he's saying he said ain't gonna be no rain at my word i am who i am by the grace of god but there ain't gonna be no rain no do it ain't gonna be no mist ain't gonna be nothing to water this ground at my word now go tell Baal that Baal is in charge of the elements as they saw it so only Baal could shut up heaven only Baal could sin or keep the faith from raining so elijah's letting them know who the real god is He's showing them who the real worshipers of God are. And that's what we need in the world today, right? Romans 8, 19. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. 
And that's why these situations that we see with these bills and these laws and stuff, God's waiting on somebody to stand up, somebody to represent him, somebody with a moral compass, somebody with a true north, somebody that's not going to let go of his commandments and his will and his purposes for our lives, somebody that will stand and represent him, somebody that will demonstrate power, somebody that will demonstrate unity, somebody that will demonstrate love, somebody that will feed the hungry and clothe the naked and take care of the widows and the orphans and all the different things that are needed. So God is raising up some people in 2024 who are not afraid of the status quo. People who are not afraid to swim upstream. People who would rather be potent than popular. He's raising them up. People who are not trying to get uh, the White House right, but people who are getting their own house. We tell my people, they need to put prayer back in school. You need to be prayer back at your house. And so God is trying to do that. People who understand that God's house is much more important than the White House. And all that has its role in its place. But my house, he said, shall be called the house of prayer from all all people. And his house shall be the glory of God. The glory of the latter house shall be more glorious than the former. So God is raising up voices that will speak to the current events of this new counterculture and say what God says, even when nobody wants to hear it. That's what Paul meant when he said we had to be instant in season and out of season. We got to preach when it's good and good to preach, good environment, when it's not a good environment to preach. We shouldn't change our message based on our crowd. And based on our, we shouldn't shut our mouths based on who's there and who's not there. We shouldn't be political. We shouldn't be any other thing but kingdom and kingdom minded and say what thus saith the Lord. In our Wednesday series, uh, we, we're calling a group um, the holy remnant or creative minority and that's who we are they're extremes that the separatists over here who say come out from among them be separate say the lord don't even go into the world and then you have all the way to the extreme syncretism or the syncretists where they just blend everything together and say can't we all just get along as if all roads lead to the same god and so you have them that just want to compromise just to get over you got these over here who don't want to engage anything but there's a creative minority and that's the kingdom of God. That's the people of God. Save people. You'll know them by their fruits. Save people. People who show enough save and who will not compromise their faith like the Hebrew boys and Daniel. That's our study during the week. Please be there. So this will be um, um, the people that will be marked them for attack. When Jesus was anointed and heaven opened, this is my beloved son, the enemy came 40 days and 40 nights and tried to get him to deny his God. Uh, these are the people that when we survive this um, and when we are marked and when we do stand up, we're going to have to learn how to. I had on an Ali t-shirt this morning, Ali sweatshirt, Muhammad Ali. We're going to learn how to stick and move. You, you, got, you got to learn how to hit it and get out of the way. And that's what we find Elijah doing. Watch this. So Elijah stands up, right? That's what he's doing in the text. He says what he says, no rain, tell Baal that. And after he preaches this, and it doesn't rain, God shuts it up. Then God said, now, get out of there. Get out of there. God told him to go and hide. Hide by a brook called Cherub. Verse 3. Go away. Get away. Get away from here. Turn eastward and hide by the brook cherub, which flows into Jordan. Hide. <laughs> you just said it ain't going to rain. God just spoke to you. You believe you're a man of God. You're a prophet. Now run. <laughs> Stick and move. What is cherub? Cherub, the word cherub means to cut down or to cut off. So he tells him basically this. Separate yourself now from everything and everybody. I got something I need to do with you. God has a way of taking folk that he's about to use just out of sight for a season, out of view for a season. Before he puts anybody on center stage, he first takes them backstage. If, if, if you know anything about backstage, when I used to do all those TBN shows, you go backstage, right? They take you backstage before all the audience is sitting out there. How many of y'all have gone down to TBN with me? Get on that bus. You get on, let me see your hand high. Hold it up. You get on that bus. You ride down. I used to wonder, why y'all on that bus? Some people, some of y'all ain't been to nothing else, but you want to go get on TBN. <laughs> that was free. Right? So we get down there, and they take you to the back, right? 
because they got to get you ready for the center stage. They got to get you ready for the show. What they have to do It's 48 degrees in the studio so that you don't sweat, so that the makeup will remain in place. But they take you back there and they put the makeup on you, right? And then for me, they always take out that little can of hairspray. <laughs> little spray on here. They say, you want me to take care of that for you? And man, get away from me, you know. So then they take the powder and just kind of shine, take the shine off the top of that, and they hook you up. They get you ready for center stage. But it's back there, and the people out front don't even know where you are. They don't know who's coming out. And some people don't know who's going to be on the show. And then when we come out, they go like, oh, and they go like, that's my favorite. That's all the other people, not me. I just come out. They just come. But they be like tripping on this favorite people. So God has a way of first taking you backstage before he puts you center stage. So God says, go to the brook. The Bible says that when he gets there, when he finally arrives at his gate, I mean, his destination, his connection, God has something planned for him. He gets there in obedience to God, and there is where God sustains him in the drought that he has called for. Right? God, in essence, has provision for him in a place that the Bible calls there. So the provision eventually at the brook comes to an end, right? The brook dries up. So God speaks to him again. When God is using you, you've got to not just hear God's voice, but you've got to keep hearing God's voice. You know how many of y'all are stuck because you're trying to do what God told you to do, but you ain't willing to do what he's telling you to do? What he told you to do is keeping you in a rut, keeping you where you are, when all you got to do is listen to what he is saying and not get stuck on what he said. So he told him to go to Cherub. Now he's telling him he's got to get up from there. So when God is using you, you got to keep on hearing the voice of God. Remember, it's not what he told you. It's what he's telling you. So if he had only done what God had told him to do, he would have died at that brook. Churches are dead right now and people are dying in the kingdom because they're only doing what God told them to do. They're stuck in tradition. They're stuck in their buildings. They're stuck in the church of the high steeple and few people. They're stuck in the stained glass windows behind those windows. They're stuck hearing a preacher preach and hearing a choir sing and having deacons moan. They're stuck in and just stuck in, in, the, in, in what God said. That's how they started. That's what God told them to do. But what is he telling them to do? And somebody that's listening to me, you got to be able to do what he's telling you to do. You need a strong ecclesiology. You need to understand the nature, the purpose, and the structure of the church. You need new methodologies and strategies. You've got to use the right bait to catch the right fish, the right people, fish. It make you fishers of men. And you've got to have the power of God. You've got to be open to allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through your life so that you can represent God properly in there. So not what he's told you, it's what he's telling you. I've got to get through this. So remember, God allows the brook to dry up, and then he tells him, to go to a place called Zarephath. God makes him a promise that his needs will be met there as well. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. This is going to get good. God tells him that a widow has been instructed to take care of him there. So here's Elijah. He's traveled quite a distance to get there. And homeboy is not only thirsty, he had a little something from the brook, probably kept a little sad, but he's, he's, he's thirsty and he's hungry. So he arrives at the widow's place and just like God said, this woman had just come in from Publix and she's putting all her groceries away. <laughs> because God said that she's going she to provide for you. I know you're hungry. So she's got her groceries from, well, help them take them in the house. Help them take, brothers, listen, if your wife come home from the grocery store and you know she got a couple of cases of water, the least you can do is go out and get the water. You don't, when she don't come over, you don't sit there and say, did you, did you get any grits? No, she got nine bags on her arm trying to get in the house and you sitting there with the channel selector in your hand, flipping, watching the game, and can't even help get up. I, ask me how I know. <laughs> I 
Confession is good for the soul. You got to keep in mind that God said that the widow had been commanded to provide for him. Right? But look at what happened when Elisha gets there and he's hungry. He asked for something to eat. That's how I know he's hungry. Verse 12. So she said, he said, give me something to eat. She said, at the Lord your God lives. I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in. Your prophet, you should have known this. That I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we might eat it and die. God said this widow is going to provide for you. She ain't got nothing. Elijah is going to be with this woman for months until the, the drought is over. But all the lady has is a little bit of oil, a little bit of meal, and she's going to make a cake, and she and her child are going to eat it and die. So here's the deal. Here's what drew me to this message. God has led him there. And here's what I put on the screen. And there is a place of lack with nothing but a promise. I don't know where you're going. But when you get there, you may have nothing but a promise. And you may not see how you're going to make it. You may have nothing but a promise. And it may look like God has duped you. That God has tricked you. It may look that way, but he got there. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? You got to get what I'm talking about. Has anybody been there? Anybody there right now? Anybody in that place right now? You arrive, watch this, exactly in the place that God wants you to. But when you get there, there is nothing there to cause you to believe that where you are is where God wants you to be. Try explaining that to your friends that's wondering why you're there. Try to explain that to your family that can't figure out why you went there. Ain't nothing there for you. They can't see because they don't have the promise. But there is a place. But sometimes all you got is a promise from God. So I believe it's symbolic. And what do I mean? I believe that God wants to lead us to places in life where he alone is our source. He wants us to have total dependency upon him. He let us do our thing all our lives. He let us work hard, get our education. He let us purchase stuff, get good credit. We got all that kind of stuff. And we're telling people, look what uh, I've been able to accomplish in my life. And God said, before you die, I want to get you in a place to where you say, I am what I am. By the grace of God, everything I got, God gave it to me. Everything I own belongs to God. He says, I want you to, before you leave this earth, to give me some glory for taking care. Taking care of you. Oh, this is about to get good. I'm about to, I'm about to, I'm about to go. Many of us have been there. Many people in the Bible have been there. Daniel was there. He wound up in a den of lions because he took a stand for God. Like many of us, he had destiny and a dilemma. You can have purpose and problems. You can have destiny and all kinds of dilemmas. You can have it. You, you can have it. They're going to be tests and trials for every child of God. The Hebrew boys were there. Amen. Standing for God, but also standing in a fiery furnace. But the Bible said there was a fourth man. Who looked like the son of God. That was with him in a situation that didn't look like they were going to able to navigate. But God was with them and God insulated. In each of these situations, it was only God that could deliver them. David was there many times. Running from Saul, hiding in caves, running through. David was there. Ruth was there gleaning in the fields. Good God Almighty. Ruth out there with a Ruth out a Moabitess winds up in the genealogy of Jesus. But for a minute there, all she was doing 
was getting with everybody left. And then here came Boaz. Y'all ain't helping me here. Oh, there's a Boaz for some of y'all. There's a Boaz. It don't have to be, I ain't talking about getting married. I ain't talking about all that stuff right now. But there's a kinsman redeemer. There's somebody that's got what you need. There's somebody that's going to alleviate you begging. There's somebody that's going to keep you from just going out here acting like you ain't got nowhere to go and don't nobody love you. Because when you say you're going to follow somebody else's God that knows the true and the living God, when you say that you want to serve God, that you want your people to be my people and my people to be your people, when you sell out to God, God will provide for you. God will send you a Boaz with your there that place there is a tight place there's a place that only fits you there is that trial there is that test that is tailor-made just for you that's there there is that place that when you survive it you're better off because of it my mama used to say if it won't kill you to make you fat so so what happens is there is that place to where after you've been through whatever the hell you had to go through, when you get to that place, you're going to be better for it. There is that place that looks like what you're going through is going to kill you but God. There is that place of many afflictions, but the Lord delivers you out of them all. There is that place where the weapons that are formed against you don't prosper. Oh, they're coming arrows by day. They're coming ditches are being dug. They're coming. Folk are lying on you, stabbing you in the back. People are trying to destroy your reputation, trying to kill you, trying to rob you blind, trying to take everything you got. But you're there by the grace of God. And it's there that God will deliver you. There is a tough place. But there's a place where you know without a doubt that God is there with you. They do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil for thou art with me. There. There, 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 there. There is one heck of a place to be. Conditions are not perfect there. And everyone around you tells you it can't be God. Have you ever been there? Where you, you, you ain't got what you say you're going to do. You don't have the means to do what you say you're going to do. You got dreams. You got ideas. You got concepts. You got all this kind of stuff. And they look at you and say, how are you going to do it? I'm preaching for them right back in the back. How are you going to get that degree? How are you going to buy that house? How are you going to buy that? How are you going to get that? How are you going to do it? But God has you there. And when you're there, don't nobody else have to see it. All you need to know is to steal small voice of God and let God provide for you. This is about to get good. When you're there, it doesn't matter what it looks like. When you're there, it doesn't matter what folks say. Yeah, you, you, you say to them, it's all right. I'm right where God wants me to be. It is well, it is well. With my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is with my I'm directing. It is well. Now, when, when that, that they wrote that song based on the lady in the text that said it is well, but her son had died. Her son had died. It wasn't well. The Bible says she was tormented. She had issues. She was going through. She lost her child. And she ran to the prophet. But when she got to the prophet's house, the prophet's servant came outside. And so when the prophet's servant, Gehazi, said, is it well? She said, it's well. 
She wasn't saying it was well. She was saying as far as you're concerned as well because you can't help me. I did not come to see you. I came to see the man of God. I came to see the one that prophesied that I would have a child this time next year. I came to the source. You can't help me. It's where as far as you can. How many times you said to people when they asked you how you're doing, you said, I'm all right. You don't take the time to stop and tell them nothing because you know they can't help you. You know they ain't got what you need. So you just look the part, you just smile, you just grin, and you walk away and you say, it is well. That's all she was saying. It is well. You can't help me. Tell somebody, you can't help me. You can't even see me. There is more. There is a place where people want to come to your rescue, but you say, I don't need your help right now. I'm going to need you after a while, but not right now. God's working it out. What solace is there? What comfort is there to know that God is working it out? So I'm trying to get y'all there in 2024, but you know that whatever betides, God will take care of you. There is where you say, please, don't try to get me out of this one. Don't call nobody. I don't, I don't need nobody coming to my house talking about somebody sit me over here. No, I don't need that. Like the Hebrew boys and like Daniel, God's going to get me out of this one. Now, don't be like them foolish folk and God send you a cruise liner, helicopter, boat and everything. Talking about you waiting on the Lord. <laughs> You better catch the first thing smoking. If it's God, don't, don't, I ain't talking about that. But I'm talking about that, that place where you, <laughs> you know God sent you there. Anybody here feel like right now, help me, because I, I, I'm telling you what I heard in the spirit. I'm going to close it. I, I, anybody right now feel like you're under construction? And you don't see how it's going to work out? You know you don't have enough money to finish the construction, but you're fine with it because God put you. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know how it's going to work out, but you know God put you there. So I'm going to close y'all with this. When you're there, your testimony is real simple. It's like, please be patient with me. Because God is not through with me yet. When you're there, can you imagine if you could walk around like that all the time? You know stuff ain't what it ought to be. You know things are not right. You know that God's working. You know you're under construction, but you're fine with it. You know people know about you. You know you done messed up. You know that you're in the condition that you're in because of the decision that you made. But you're saying to yourself, I'm all right. Be patient with me. God is not through with me. God's not signing off on your foolishness either. God is waiting on you to get your act together while you're there so you'll come back to him. So here are three things that I don't want you to forget about there. Three things and I'm done. Number one, there is a place of promise. Verse four. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, but I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. That's my promise. Verse 9, arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain him. When Elijah got there at the brook, the ravens flew in and out uh, on time each day, brought him his daily bread, just like God promised. When he got there at Zarephath, the widow had just enough to eat and die. But then God defied the laws of nature and provided for his prophet and those who would help him, just like he promised. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he not spoken, shall he not make it good? Have he not said it, shall he not bring it to pass? Whatever God has promised you, he is well able to bring it to pass. Whatever God has said about you, he says, I know what I'm doing. I know the plans that I have for you. 
plans to prosper you and to do you good plans to bring you to that expected end to give you the future that you hope for that you believe for that I put in your spirit the destiny that I put in you not where you want to go not what you want to do but my will will be done my word will not return unto me void but it shall accomplish in the thing that I sent it to do if I told you you're going to land at that gate it may not be at the time you expected but eventually you ain't going to circle the airport for heaven eventually you're going to land and you're going to get to your gate and you're going to make your connection even if you got to miss a flight or two you may have to wait till tomorrow you may have to stay in a Marriott tonight but I promise you you won't stay in that Marriott forever because what I got planned for you will come to pass somebody throw your head back and shout in this place and so here we go and God don't need much to do it with either but God, I've been saving up. I just, I, I, I want to do this, but I ain't got to. God knows how much you don't have. He knows who's parked at your gate. But that's your gate. The pilot, remember, the pilot said, there's another plane at our gate. It's just like right now, some of y'all believe in God for some stuff, but some other folk are at it. There's some folk already there. <laughs> but it's yours. He's the God of The Hebrew boys, the, the children of Israel, went into the promised land. But it was inhabited. Seven nations mightier than them were in that land. But God said, it's your land. I gave it to you. They just cutting the grass for you. But they watering the flowers for you. Come on, there's some stuff I'm telling y'all, people, God said it's yours. So just drive on by there and thank them for keeping it up for you until you get there. Come on, tell them thank you for holding my job down until I get there. Because I don't know whether you're going to leave or whether they're going to fire you. But some kind of way you're going to be out of the way and it's going to be my job. Y'all not helping me here. That's the way God works. Little becomes much when you put it in the master's hand. You don't need a whole lot. Just a little bit. Just a little meal. Just a little oil. And we'll starve no more. Number two, there is a place of providence. What is providence? God's providence is God's caring provision for his people. The providence of God. When he told the prophet to go to the brook and to go to Zarephath, he had, watch this, oh, this is already commanded the ravens, already commanded the widow to release their stuff. A raven is a ravenous is a is a selfish, dirty bird. They don't give their food away. God made these ravens, these blackbirds. <laughs> take their stuff and take it to this prophet. The widow was gonna eat and die, but she gave it to the prophet. So I've come today to tell somebody. That in the midst of what appears to be a drying up of your resources or lack of support and not having enough, in his providence, God has somebody waiting, ready to release what you need. As we go into this year, you've got to make up in your mind, you ain't going to sit back and wait on it, don't. Because you got to go get. David said, Lord, should I pursue? God says, get up and go after it. He'd already said, wherever your feet shall throw, shod, trod upon. That's what I, I give you. So you got to get up and go get it. It ain't coming to you. You got to go apply for the job. They ain't bringing it to you. You got to make, oh, y'all ain't helping me here. You got to go enroll in school. Your degree ain't coming out of, out of the out of the clear blue sky. You got to do something. You take one step, somebody said, he'll take two. I don't know whether that's true or not, but you got to bust a move. You got to get up and do something, right? They're waiting on you to show up. They just need you to obey the voice of God like Elisha did and just 
show up and God will provide. I'm closing y'all. But when you follow God's directive for your life, there are no accidents. There are no coincidences. There are no surprises. God will make a way out of no way. Where God guided, he's already provided. If it's God that brought you here, then God's going to take care of you here. It's there and it's waiting on you. How many of y'all are wanting to go there this year? How many of y'all will go there this year? How many of y'all want to go there this year? He provided for uh, you there. He takes care of you there and he'll make a way for you there. So the last point I want to make, number three, there is a place of power. A place of power. Yeah, when he was there, not only did the ravens feed him uh, daily and give up their morsel of food, not only did the widow woman make him a, break, uh, a piece of cake first and, and then the meal and the oil never ran out, but while he was there, the woman of Zarephath, who was a widow, had that boy that was, she was making the cake for and they were going to eat and die. But something happened. Verse 21. The boy died. So Elijah had to do something. He the one that prophesied. So verse 21. Y'all go with me. He stretched himself on the child three times. He cried out to the Lord and said, Oh Lord my God. I pray. Let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. A place of power. Now notice, Elijah heard the voice of God to get there. And now God hears the voice of Elijah to show his power. Y'all don't get that. James said concerning Elijah that the fervent and the effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. He was talking about Elijah. He said he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain and then it rained. He said, man, when you know how to pray, you can get God to move. Elijah straddles himself over this boy and says, oh, Lord, my God. God, I need you to help me right now. I need you to not just provide, but I need you to show out. I need a miracle right now. God, I need the power of God in my life right now. You can be there all you want to, but if you're there without some power, you're just there. You're going to need power to fix things that are broken around you. And God raised up this child. There's power in the place up there there's power and restoration there I can't quit talking about there because there is that place that is impossible for you but it's just right for God anybody been there anybody there right now it's impossible for you but it's just right for God I don't care what you try to tell me God can handle it is there anything too hard for God no God can do anything but fail because they don't think that God would put them there they don't see how God's going to work it out there but brothers and sisters the safest place on the planet is right there I, I, I want to be there I, I, I thought about I'll take you there yeah 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 there, there's a place in the sun where there's hope for everyone gotta find me that place in the sun because of there you're going to prosper brothers and sisters the safest place is there right smack in the center of God's will for your life that's where you'll you'll die if, if you try to do something without him if, if you're there and God's not there you're not going to make it but if you're there and God sent you there God's got your back so here's what there looks like and I'm finished for real you may have a promise from God but it doesn't look like it's going to come to pass this is the place called there you know you're broke you know times are hard but you're still seeing the Lord provide for you in the midst of being in the worst predicament that you've ever been in that's what I mean by a place called there. 
And if that ain't you, something wrong with you. Because there's no way anybody under the sound of my voice can think that what you have is your provision. To think that where you are is safe. Nowhere, no place is safe without God commissioning you there. No place is safe without God being there with you. I want to be where you are. Oh God, help me. God, you said you never leave me nor forsake me. So wherever I am, wherever there is, I thank you for being there with me. If you are in a total turmoil and don't know what the future holds and for some crazy reason you still believe that everything gonna be all right, you might be there. In other words, you don't know. You don't know. You ain't told nobody. Nobody knows where you're running to. Nobody knows where you're running from. Everybody sees you smiling and they think everything is all right. But all you are is there. All you are is at that place where you know, God's got me. So you ain't lying when you say I'm blessed and highly favored. You ain't blind when you say it's going to be all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. You got bills. I'm all right. I'm all right. Your children acting the fool. I'm all right. I'm all right. Come on, somebody here. That's that place called there. So look at somebody and ask them, are you there yet? Are you there yet? Are you there yet? Are you on your way there? Do you want to go there this year? Well, listen to me. Right now, why don't you act like you're there? Why don't you, in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your situation, in the midst of your dilemma, why don't you right now act like you're there? Act like God's providing. Act like God got your back. Open up your mouth. Throw your head back. Reach way down and shout. your den. Shout in your living room. Shout in the kitchen. You might be there. That might be your there. Trouble in your home, but God's got you. Trouble in your mind, but God's got you. Children acting the fool, but God's got you. Freak everybody out in your house. Freak your neighbors out. Freak everybody up the street. Open up your windows. Open up the door. I don't got cold in here. And just start shouting. And let them know that everything, everything, everything is going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Jesus is going to work it out. Jesus is going to work it out. I don't have what I need, but I got him and that. E no, throw your head back, reach way down, shout. You call it crazy, I call it fair. You think it's lack, but I call it there because it's there that I got a promise. It's there that he provides and it's there where the power of the Lord is. It's there. You remember what it's like to be. We pray you were blessed by the worship experience here at the Potter's House. Make sure you share this word with a loved one on your timeline and newsfeed. And remember, there are ways that you can give. First, you can give by text by simply texting the word GIVE to 904-601-1695. Follow the prompts and you will receive a confirmation text of your gift. You may also give online at tphim.org backslash give. You can give through our Ministry One or Ezekiel Church app by downloading the app and following the instructions to give. Or you can mail in your gifts addressed to TPHIM at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. Once again, we thank you for your continued generosity to the Potter's House. And for those of you who have answered the call to salvation, please call or text us at 855-TPH4JAX. That's 855-874-4529. And until the next time, remember to share this message and stay connected via Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPH Jacks. 
May God bless you and keep you until our next digital gathering.